Well, first, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I am Marjorie Bronster, and I, along with my colleague Corey Weck here, will be talking about the claims that we filed against the Navy and what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, as some of you may remember, I was once the Attorney General, and in that position, I really felt great gratification to be able to work for the people of the state of Hawaii. And at this point, I think it's necessary to step in once again and try and right wrongs that the Navy, in this case, have started. Joining me today is Corey Weck, a partner of McCune Wright Aravilo, a retired Marine Corps major. And Bronster Fujichaku Robbins and our mainland firm will be pursuing claims on behalf of individuals who have suffered and struggled with what the Navy has done. We felt we just had to step in. The people who have suffered without water, it's more than an inconvenience. They've suffered financially, they've suffered with their health, and their, they've suffered a total upheaval in their lives and well-being. What we've started to do so far on behalf of more than a dozen claimants is we have filed claims against the Navy, which is a precursor to a potential lawsuit on behalf of all of those who have suffered from the lack of water. Now I'd like to turn it over to Corey Weck, who along with his mainland firm will be working with us on these claims. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Corey Weck. I'm a partner in the firm of McCune Wright Aravalo out of Southern California. I'm also a retired Marine Corps officer. I served over 20 years in uniform. In fact, some of that time was here on Oahu, where I served as a reserve deputy staff judge advocate for Marine Forces Pacific. So I've got intimate knowledge of the base facilities and what goes on those bases. What I find ironic in this situation here is that from the first time I became a, a Marine and earned the title of U.S. Marine, we we're always taught things about accountability and responsibility, except for, as I found out over the years of service in the Marine Corps, it doesn't apply at the highest levels. So when tragedy occurs to our service members and more importantly their family members, the government at the highest level tends to turn its backs on those service members. And that's why we got involved in this case, because it's time to hold the government accountable and responsible for the harm that it causes to those people that defend our country. And as, as many people know, it is not just the service members. There are many in the community who are retired. It is not just the service members. There are many in the, in the community who are retired, who are living on base, who are living near the base, and who their families and non-military personnel who have been affected by the water problems. Tens of thousands of people are potentially at risk. We will um, make ourselves available for questions at the end, but I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Dora Barilla. Um, she is a public health expert who will discuss the larger community impact of the events of the last few months. Thank you, Marjorie, and good afternoon oh, to everyone. Sound yet. Good afternoon. Am I there, Sammy? Well, it's actually morning, but go ahead. OK, good. It is good morning. I'm, I apologize. I'm in California today, but um, good morning to all. As Marjorie mentioned, my name is Dora Barilla, and I'm a doctor of public health, and I've spent the last 35 years working with hospitals, health systems, and public health, looking at improving overall community health and well-being. And I'm here to talk to you about some public health precautions to keep you and your family safe. And so I want to just outline um, just a few things for, for tips for, for you and your family. I want to start by talking a little bit about what I mean by exposure and contamination, not to state the obvious, but just to set the precedence before I go into uh, you know, my key points, is that contamination can really occur in three ways, through your lungs, digestive system, or through your skin. And exposure can happen in everyday activities, such as eating and drinking, 
This would include using water for your gardens or washing your fresh fruits and vegetables. It also includes breathing in vapors from contaminated water or skin contact with contaminated water during just routine activities such as bathing, washing your hands, or doing laundry. So I just want to ask you to be mindful of how you can be exposed and take precautions with ne when, when necessary. The health effects of contaminated water will really depend on the amount and duration and how much of the fuels you've been exposed to for how long and how you were exposed. Some common symptoms that I'd ask you to watch for if you feel that you've been exposed or have potential exposure are difficulty breathing, abdominal pain and vomiting, skin irritation, drowsiness, restlessness, and in extreme conditions of exposure convulsions. Repeated exposure over months to years is considered to be chronic or long-term exposure. And Dr. McAvoy, who will follow me, will discuss that a little more in detail. One population I just want to take special note in, in my comments are what we call vulnerable populations or individuals who might be immunocompromised. We want to actually put some extra caution out for this group of in individuals. Although science shows that it, you know, there's not conclusive evidence that exposure to water with jet fuel causes greater harm to these groups, common sense and past experience guide us in using precautions for any harmful contamination to these groups that are vulnerable or, or, or that are already immunocompromised. And as I mentioned, this includes our children, pregnant and nursing mothers, someone with a, a, a weak end immune system, or individuals with underlying chronic conditions, such as cancer, diabetes, or heart disease. So please be cautious if you are in any of those groups. I wanna finish my comments by really talking about how you can re reduce your risks. We know that water really is the foundation of life, as I mentioned the ways in which uh, you can become contaminated. Uh, that's just basically through, through living. And we all wanna keep our, our family safe. So I wanna leave you with some really important points to, um, to, to just put in your pocket and share with yourself and your family. One, be mindful of symptoms and monitor for any changes in your health or your behavior. Be sure to talk to your healthcare provider about any concerns and have them be your partner in monitoring you and your family's health. Please be diligent around um, ensuring that your water is clean. Check once, once you return or, or you know, you're in a, in a situation where you're using the water, be sure to check for any signs of cloudiness. Make sure that the water's color is acceptable. Be sure to check for any unusual or strong smell. Ensure that water is not accumulating in or around your, your house in any places. I also uh, want to leave you with some um, some key resources in terms of ongoing monitoring and updates of the safety of the water. Obviously, the Navy has their website, the Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickman um, up, uh, uh, website updates, and that's at cpf.navy.mil. But I also want to leave you with um, some resources from the EPA. This, they have a safe drinking water hotline that can be reached at 1-800-426-4791. And again, that's 1-800-426-4791. Or you can visit their website at www.epa.gov and search for Safe Water Labs. And you can partner with the recommendations of the labs and um, work with them to test and filter your water appropriately. I also ask that, you're, that you consider your pets and their water consumption and exposure as well. I would encourage you to be your own advocate and be sure you're in tune with potential risks. Be sure you're partnering with your healthcare provider and being diligent about any con health conditions and ensure that there's ongoing communication especially if you have any of the vulnerabilities I mentioned earlier. Be sure to stay diligent and informed about the quality of water in your home. Awareness and prevention are going to be your greatest protection for you and your family. This is a time 
to be fully aware of any potential risk and to prevent any further contamination or exposure. Thank you for your time today. Next, we have emergency room physician and healthcare CEO, Dr. Larry McAvoy, to discuss the health consequences of consuming contaminated water. Um, one other <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> Love it linkage of technology. Yes, it is, right? <laughs> I had to live with it, but now I'm used to it. <laughs> Perhaps we can take some questions in the meantime. Oh while we're waiting. I don't know how long. Just give me the heads up. And So does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, just um, talk about the number of claimants. And does, I, mean, I haven't read it, so what, what does it say? Well, basically, each claimant has their own individual claim against the Navy. And that's the process that has to be done initially. So here, we've got one person's claim. Um, it, it explains what the Navy did, how the claimant has been adversely affected, and for each claimant, we will be putting together a detailed inventory um, and submitting it to the Navy. So we've, d we've started that already, and as we proceed, I assume we'll have more and more people who will want to submit this. If we want to sue the Navy, this is a, a, some, a first step that we have to do. So if the Navy does not respond and does not uh, compromise or deal with the claim at this initial level, they will face litigation. And at that point, we can bring a claim on behalf of the group of claimants. Can you talk about the challenges of suing the Navy? But yours is going against the Navy. That's correct. That's correct. And it is, it is quite a different approach. Uh, but we felt it was necessary to go after the Navy because they're the ones responsible. And the process... Sorry, I got distorted all of a sudden. The process is um, governed by the Federal Tort Claims Act, uh, which is difficult. But not only is the procedure difficult, it is tough to take on an adversary like the Navy. It's not going to be easy, and you know it could take a long time to do so. There's a lot of information we still don't have, a lot of information I think that has not been forthcoming, and we're going to need to develop an awful lot. Um, and that's why we're working with a team of, of experts from the mainland, from here, and we're looking forward to fighting the fight. Um, some of you may know that I've fought fights against, against uh, large adversaries in the past, and sometimes it's just something you have to do. Can you talk a bit about the precedent, uh, any sort of precedent that there is for this kind of case, large case against the Navy, and what the results were? Do you want to I can take address that? that. Uh, two years ago, Camp Lejeune had a very similar circumstance. I'm sorry. A few years ago, Camp Lejeune, a Marine Corps base on the East Coast, was similarly affected by contaminated water. Um, it took a substantial amount of time uh, and a tremendous amount of resources of the firms that represented the individuals to try and bring some justice to those people that had been affected. So this is not unprecedented in terms of the government polluting the water sources of our service members and their families and the local populations. So there is precedent. What was the result of that? Uh, it was mixed results, to be honest. It's never easy to sue the federal government. Uh, they have all the resources in the world, and that's why firms such as ours and Marjorie's are brought in to help bring some balance to the scales of justice. Is it because the, the 
there's there's so much weight behind the federal government that they ha automatically have an advantage, or is that the way the law is, is structured, or, or not necessarily? But they do have a substantial uh, step up, if you will, because of the assets of the United States government against the individual law firms that bring these cases on behalf of the individuals who have been harmed. So it is an uphill battle. Uh, but it's a battle that we think is necessary in these kinds of cases to bring to the government in order to bring some semblance of justice and fairness to those that have been harmed by the wrongful acts of the government. Do you think this case is going to be any easier because uh, the Navy has essentially admitted, while the, the facts are very strong in the claimant's case, the Navy has admitted that they contaminated the water, hard to argue against that, does that make it any easier? Not necessarily. My firm's handled multiple, multiple cases against the federal government, and I've never had the federal government roll over on a case. Uh, there's other aspects to a lawsuit that you have to prove, such as causation. Were the injuries sustained by the contamination and damages are the other aspect that you have to prove and what kind of damages each individual has uh, sustained. So is the Camp Lejeune cases, are, is, it, is it still ongoing? I'm not too familiar with whether or not it's still ongoing, but it has been several years since the initial contamination. I mean, it goes back at least a decade, if I think so. And it looks as though we have Dr. McAvoy. So we'll, we'll be able to come back to us. Great. Thank you. Um, just checking now, since I went through my uh, remarks once and, and lost you all, everyone hearing me okay? In that case, good morning, Hawaii. And I'm sure a lot of my comments will overlap with those of Dr. Barilla. I really want to make, I think, three points uh, today. One is uh, know the symptoms, both the short-term symptoms and the long-term symptoms of uh, jet fuel exposure, particularly that through water. Uh, Number two, trust your water source. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Point number three, talk to your doctor and your neighbors about what's going on. Really, really helpful to us as physicians as we try to help you through something that can be uh, puzzling and confusing and also potentially very harmful to you. In terms of the long and short term symptoms, when people are exposed to uh, aviation fuel, because these fuels evaporate early, as Dr. Barilla said, um, you can get exposure by breathing it in into your uh, gastrointestinal tract by swallowing it or having it in food or water or by having it touch your skin. And typically what people see uh, in uh, the short term is if they're exposed to particular or uh, significant amounts of these chemicals, they'll have headaches, uh, nausea, uh, dizziness. They may feel a little bit unsteady on their feet or uncoordinated. Um, they may find that their memory just doesn't seem to be working well. And typically in the short term, if um, it's a brief exposure, those things will resolve. But there's also quite a bit of research on the long-term effects of uh, these chemicals. Um, they can cause weakening of your immune system. They can cause what we call uh, neuropsychological symptoms. In other words, um, changes in your attention span, your ability to concentrate, uh, your mood, um, as well as your ability to process more complex cognitive tasks. You just don't think as well. Um, you can't concentrate as long, things like this. And there's also evidence that uh, these chemicals can uh, impact your immune system over time. So there's a body of research out there. It continues to grow um, as we find out more and more about uh, what chemicals people have been and are exposed to and what effects are short term and long term. Interestingly, because these chemicals evaporate so quickly, they're what we call volatile. Um, they uh, really can get sort of all over your body. Our bodies are 45 to 55% water anyway. So if they're in the water that you drink, they can easily move into the water that is throughout your body. And they also tend to concentrate in tissues that have high lipid content, which means that if you drink water with fuel in it, it doesn't necessarily disperse everywhere in a uniform way. It tends to concentrate in certain tissues. And we worry about it concentrating in, in brain and neural tissue. And we worry about it concentrating in places like uh, your marrow and things like that. Um, point number two um, goes sort of along with one. Obviously, if you're having exposure to these chemicals, you'll want to stop it as soon as possible, which means making sure that you really trust your water source. If your water smells bad or tastes bad, um, either get it tested or just change water supplies for a bit, even if you have to uh, bring water in from another source via bottles and jugs or borrow from someone who has a water source that you trust. 
Um, and again, I think in this regard, it's really helpful to um, have neighbors talking with each other to find out what uh, exposure sources might be linked to a household or a particular block or a particular well supply. So having that conversation and trusting your water source at the individual household level and at the group level is very important. Um, and that group conversation is similarly important, I think, um, with regard to reporting your symptoms. Uh, one thing we as physicians uh, need is we need information about what you're seeing and hearing and noticing individually and collectively, not just once, but over time. So um, find your physician um, and let him or her know what your symptoms have been, how they wax and wane, come and go, and any long-term symptoms that you're beginning to notice. I think it's also a uh, really fair game to acknowledge that we physicians have different training, different specialty support, but also different interests. And I think the ideal physician for someone who's exposed to some of these chemicals, chemicals is one who's one really, really interested, interested in environmental, in environmental health, health and population health uh, and in occupational health. And that's a very fair question to ask your physician. Um, you could ask a doctor, you know, hey, do I need to worry about aviation fuel? And I might just shrug and say, no, you look OK, that's fine. Uh, I think finding someone who's really interested in sort of following effects, if you've been in one of these environments for a while and, and tracking those effects with you is really, really important. So again, I'll leave you with those three thoughts. Be familiar with the symptoms, short term and long term. Number two, trust your water source. Uh, get a, a new one if you have to, uh, even if it's temporary. And number three, uh, talk with your doctor, not just once, but over time and have the same conversations with your family and, and your neighbors. And as Dr. Barilla said, um, you know, Embrace that idea of, of monitoring your own health. It certainly helps us as doctors figure out what's going on over time. Again, Hawaii, thank you. So one of the claimants uh, who's trying to protect and support her family is Elisabetta Alamaliata, and she will be joining us from the mainland where she went to take uh, her mother. Um, Elisabetta is one of the claimants, one of the clients who we've met with, and just watching uh, the struggles that she and her family have gone through has really been heartbreaking. Uh, we certainly hope that we can help her and so many others like her. Um, Elisabetta? Thank you for joining us this morning. Oops. Can I ask her to speak? Are you ready? Can you speak now? Elisabetta, can you share with us a little bit about what you've been going through and why you decided to bring a claim. They muted themselves. Can you please unmute? Oh, can you unmute? I think you're muted, so we, we're having difficulty in hearing you. Okay. Can you please Thank unmute you. yourself? You're muted. Okay. Can you can you uh, click the link again? I will disconnect you, and if you can connect again. And and you'd think that we didn't test this, which we did, <laughs> and it worked so well when no one was here. That's what always happens. That's right. Okay, so while, I don't know how long that's going to take. It's just going to call right back. Okay, so we'll just wait a moment.
Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you very much for rejoining. Okay. Okay. Okay, the question is, um, how am I affected and my family? Well, um, as a mother, it's very important for me to protect my children. And I have my children living with us. And my mother was visiting us at the same time when this happened. Um, it's very comforting for me to take her away where um, this incident is happening because it's very stressful. Um, her life is already fragile, being a 75-year-old mom. So I'd rather bring her to a place that is safer, that I don't have to smell the water every time I turn on the faucet. And every time I even have to um, open a bottle of water, I'm still smelling. I feel paranoid right now. and. Even for, I'm sure other families are going through the same thing. It's a scary moment of our lives and going through COVID at this time. We know our government is spending so much of our federal dollars to, you know, for advertisements and everything to stay healthy. And water is life. If our water is contaminated, all of this is useless. We have a lot of campaigns for the community to be healthy and stay healthy. And water consumption is one of the biggest part of that health plan. And now when it's affected, it's contaminated. You know, our campaigns and even the medical issues and things that we are doing now becomes useless. I, it's important for us leaders to understand when we are talking life, we are talking about everything. We have to be good stewards of our community and our environment. You know, growing up in Samoa, water is medicine to our elders. When there's a stomach ache, they always tell us to drink water. When there's migraine headaches, they tell us to drink water. When there's anything that is, you know, we're in pain, our elders would tell us, teach us, drink water. From there, our upbringing, we bring it to now when we have our children. We are one of the longest military families that lived in military housing. And I'm a strong advocate of the community. And being good stewards of the community, you're being pono. We live in Hawaii where we have kuleana. In order for us to be good stewards, we have to be good leaders that will provide the leadership to understand what to do. I am sure a lot of our military leaders are going through so much right now. This could have been prevented. It could have been prevented. We didn't have to find out from a letter informing us. We didn't have to find out from an announcement from our leaders about this. We had to find out from our own neighbors and we had to find out from our own family members. And many times we went through, you know, being out of the shower and we feel like we're we're high, we feel dizzy, and I'm scolding my children. Why are you putting too much Clorox in to wash the bathroom or even the shower? I'm putting strains on my own kids. But I did not understand, we did not know. We asked the questions. We see all the medical issues with our skin irritation, things that could have been prevented. My husband served and he's a veteran for over 18 years. He went through PTSD and one of the things that he would always say, he misses his camaraderies. He misses his military friends and even people that he used to work for. Served three deployments in Iraq, Kuwait and Afghanistan. 
he living in the military housing brought comfort in him that he's around his military family. And he was really sad. He went through open heart surgery and everyone reacts to water contamination differently. And I feel that the pain and even the medical issues that we went through stem from this. The sensitive skin that he had, we would see the blood on the, on the bed or even the bed sheets. I did not understand. I kept telling him, go see the doctor. Maybe there's something wrong with, with the, you know, the surgery, but I did not understand the skin irritation is from this. Many, we did not understand many things. Uh, we talk about being self-sufficient. One of the therapy that I thought about as a wife is to grow our own taro. We started a small taro plantation in the back of our yard. The taro was growing really nicely in the beginning. As we continued to water it, everything died. We did not understand. We were asking the questions, maybe there's something wrong, but come to find out it was the water. Now there's rain that is naturally coming and the taro is beginning to sprout again. And we can see the healthy taro leaves. There you see, when you contaminate the water, you're contaminating our food, our food system. Buying healthy food from the stores are, is very expensive. So we have campaigns of being self-sufficient, grow our own vegetables grow our own taro. So the water contamination is also affecting our, our livelihood. And, you know, unfortunately, we're one of the families that was affected. This whole situation was such a, a hassle. We try our best to survive every single day. And unfortunately, it also happened during the holidays. And imagine moving from one hotel to another. It's too much work. And we also have to think about, you know, what can we do in order to assist in the situation by actually trying our best to, you know, to learn from different, you know, programs and even the the programs and the news that they share where doctors would share expert advice and even social media where the Navy is providing us updates. That's more like our education, you know, right now. It could have been done way, you know, earlier so that we can understand what's going on. Unfortunately, we had to find out from our neighbors. We had to ask around. And that's what we have to do. Thank you so much, Elisabetta. We appreciate your sharing with us. Are there any questions for Elisabetta? Uh, I oh, have a question I for her, Elisabetta. Oh. I, we may have lost her. Mm -hmm. Oh, there she's back. Hi, Elisabetta. Um, uh, my, 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 um, did, what specifically did you feel from drinking the water and are you still feeling uh, sick even though you're clearly not drinking the water now? A lot, A lot of, times, of times our, our healthy smoothies and um, our soup for our mom and even for, for our family, a lot of our food, we use the water to cook. And we also use the water for drinking at times, the tap water. We just, when we moved to Hawaii, we lived there for so many years, more than two decades. We were always told that Hawaii has the best 
most cleanest water in the country. And I believe that because I see how, you know, the natural habitats and, and everything in Hawaii is so beautiful and even the, the waterfalls and everything. So, you know, we always drink from the tap water and everything that we, the food that we prepare is from the tap water. Our, I feed my puppies, I have a Maltese and a Jitsu. These are house puppies that they were throwing up because they drink a lot of water. So as they were throwing up and being sick, um, my multi Sunga was hospitalized and lost three puppies because she was pregnant. So, you know, we did not understand that we're feeding them contaminated water. So right now I've been going, we've been going in to see doctors throughout the whole time, even before, and we always have problems with being feeling bloated and, you know, even you feel like, you know, different, dizzy and um, a headache, sore throat when you're swallowing, all these medical issues. My children would say, mom, I feel um, pain when I swallow. But, you know, to me, I thought it's just, you know, an everyday thing, but throughout the whole time, we did not understand until this, you know, when we smelled it with, with the, with the water. And, you know, we started hearing from our neighbors, we were asking questions. Yes. From skin lesions and rashes. And we actually have some photos um, that she shared with us that she's willing to share as well. And I don't know whether we can bring those up. We can bring those up for you to see. Before the Navy or anybody informed them of the contamination to the water, um, she was showering, bathing, um, as she said, cooking uh, with the contaminated water and it really had a, a huge impact. She's still with us? On the yes. Once she st stopped using the water, the lesions started to clear up. Did it, did it cause hair loss too, or is that, or is the lesion just on the, her skin? I, I, I don't know. I'm obviously, there's a, there are a lot of questions that we need to see what the doctors say, but. I have very, I have very sensitive, sensitive skin. So a lot of us react to this water contamination differently. And, you know, unfortunately, um, my family is one of those people that are, have sensitive skin that was greatly affected by this. Um, you know, it's really sad to know about it, um, the long-term effects of this. I am really scared um, to know that we've consumed water that is contaminated for a very long time. And it's unfortunate that we had to deal with it. Um, you know, uh, my children are also affected and, you know, no one should be going through all of this, it's very challenging and it disrupts your everyday living. Like I mentioned, you know, even when I'm at the airport, uh, when I brought my mom up to Seattle, I'm, in, I'm at the airport, I'm turning on the sink and I probably, people see me smelling the water. I became paranoid and even to think that I'm leaving Hawaii, it's, you know, it's one of the, best countries with the cleanest water. Unfortunately, right now it has been affected and um, it could have been prevented if, you know, our leaders um, would take action in the beginning when this happened. And another disturbing thing that I feel that a lot of red flags is seeing the press releases and seeing the news where the Department of Health would say, 
you know, it happened in July of 2022 and 2021. And the other source would say it happened in November of 2021. When you see those type of conflicting news, it's disturbing because you're the one affected and somehow this type of information is inconsistent. So how does that help us to know and understand if we have people that are paid to do this job, to oversee these water tank farms or water tanks, they know that something is wrong. They could have acted on it to prevent this from happening. So it's sickening to know that going all the way back. Daily, daily with our, with our family. family and try to find ways to heal on our own as we continue to you know protect ourselves from from the water contamination that's going on at this time thank you elizabeth elizabeth can you can you hear me yes you can okay when did your symptoms begin um, you know, right now, I don't remember when it began. There are different, um, you know, times of my life that, you know, we go back, back and forth with our physician. So I'm not a doctor, but, you know, when you go in and you have a headache, you have a sore throat, you have a, uh, you know, pain, um, bloated, feeling bloated in your stomach and even, your blood sugar is way high or, you know, your, um, I think I've had a lot of ER visits and, you know, most of the times there's, um, heart, you know, uh, discomfort as well. So the stress can also be very uncomforting. <sighs> this has been very difficult for you but we appreciate your your sharing your story thank you for having me and um, I'm glad that you know we're able to share our story I know a lot of our families out there are going through a lot of struggles and challenges at this time to um, leave the island and and find a a place where it's more comfortable or safer for the children. And, um, you know, we try our best to, to take care of our families. And we try our best to learn, you know, since this incident, I've been reading more about, about water safety and even learning how to stay healthy. We're still, going through COVID at this time. We don't need another issue that is affecting our health and not helping us to prolong our, our life. Um, we've had so much stress over COVID, protecting ourselves and our families. So um, thank you so much for advocating and thank you all for having us to share our stories. It's very stressful, very challenging, but I still continue to be a community advocate. Yeah, water is life. And you know, when our water is contaminated, it takes away that lifelong dream that we all have as individuals. Thank you. Sure. Can you share the number of claimants you have so far that you're working with? Um, we have filed on behalf of about 14 claimants. Um, there are a number of other claimants with whom we're working now um, who we anticipate filing in the not-too-distant future. Um, 
But I think a lot of people don't know the process, and they don't understand that in order to file a claim against the Navy or, or to file a suit against the Navy, you first have to go through this process of filing a claim. And so, you know, we're willing to help um, people who want to file a claim. Um, you can look at oahuwaterpollution.com and uh, go on there to see if you want more information about the process and, and filing a claim. Um, but it's only once these claims have been processed that either the Navy will step in and do what's right or there will be a need to file a lawsuit and we're prepared to represent the claimants at that time. And are the military members um, able to sue the Navy or will it just be their spouses and their kids? That's correct. The military, um, the active military personnel may not file a claim, um, but their, their families, their neighbors, the peoples in the community, uh, they all can. Uh, Marjorie, given your experience as Attorney General for the state of Hawaii and given your knowledge of state law, what did you make of the congressional hearings when Navy leaders were silent on the state of Hawaii's power over the Navy in terms of regulation? Well, I was very disappointed. Um, I thought that, you know, if the Navy was going to do what's right, they should have been doing it anyway, with or without state intervention. Um, I'm pleased that they said that they would follow the Department of Health order, um, but I was very troubled by the fact that they are not willing uh, to admit that they have anybody who they have to listen to. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we felt it was necessary to step in for the claimants, because I don't know whether the Navy is going to listen to the state. I don't know. Uh, whether the Navy is going to care about individuals. <clears throat> and I think that, you know, getting a group of people together to stand up and try to hold the Navy accountable is the way to do it. Do you think the Navy will drain the rental tanks? I do. I think that they will be forced to, um, whether it's because they know that they need to or whether they um, understand that what the state ordered is is the right thing to do. Um, but I'm hopeful. But you always start out hoping that the adversary who has admitted wrongdoing and admitted um, fault is going to do the right thing. Um, but w as was stated earlier, it's not always easy. In terms of seeking compensation, uh, if you do go to a lawsuit, uh, it's kind of a, it seems like kind of a difficult thing to I mean, how do you determine a figure when these people may have long-term effects that they're tracking right now? So how will you go about determining what compensation is for? Well, um, that is always a difficult situation. But whenever you have a class action or a mass action, if you can determine liability, then the damages on an individual basis can be determined through individual processes, individual claims processes. Um, but there's a lot of information we don't have, and that's going to have to take some time to develop. What are the impacts long term? What happens if you're one of the vulnerable population? Um, how does it affect you? As you heard, even within Elisabetta's family, um, the different people um, had different impacts. And that's something that will have to come out. And how are you folks planning to gather that information? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of information that we're going to get from the claimants themselves. Um, but as time goes on, they'll, they'll need to be expert testimony. They'll need to be doctors. They'll need to be um, primary care physicians who have seen the impacts and other experts who um, have studied the area and who will be studying the area. This is not an easy um, project, but it's something that we're committing to undertake. There's been some um, confusion about when exactly the contamination began. Some people are saying, I felt off for months. What are your claimants saying about when they started to feel ill? There is a variety of um, situations, and it, it may well depend upon where you were located. It may well depend upon you know, how much of the water you were you were drinking, 
um, you know, were you out at work all day and you just came home and had an evening meal or, you know, were you at home during COVID? Um, so we, we're, that's something that we're looking to get a handle on. Unfortunately, I don't think that the Navy has been sufficiently forthcoming. And as Elisabetta said, she learned a lot of what she learned from her neighbors um, and in, people in the community. Um, so it wasn't something that she got the announcement saying, henceforth, stop drinking the water. Well, thank you very much for coming, and we appreciate your time and attention. Um, I think that this is a really serious problem for our community, and it's sad that lawyers in private practice have to come and stand up um, for the claimants. So, but we're willing to do so, and we certainly hope that others will come forward and make claims so that the Navy knows that this isn't one or two or a dozen isolated people, that it is the thousands of people who have been affected who really need to be heard. Thank you. Thank you.